Mark chapter 15 continues the Passion narrative and ends with Jesus' burial. It follows on from Peter's denial of Jesus at the end of chapter 14, which occurred just before the cock crowed at dawn. Early in the morning, after forming a plan, the chief priests with the elders and experts in the law and the whole Sanhedrin tied Jesus up, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He replied, You say so. Then the chief priests began to accuse him repeatedly. So Pilate asked him again, Have you nothing to say? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. The comment here, you say so, is the penultimate thing Jesus says in the Gospel. After this, the only thing he says are the words from the cross. Verse 6. During the feast it was customary to release one prisoner to the people, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was imprisoned with rebels who had committed murder during an insurrection. Then the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to release a prisoner for them, as was his custom. So Pilate asked them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas instead. So Pilate asked them again, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted more insistently, Crucify him! Because he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. Then, after he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. This Barabbas episode is of interest. There's no evidence that there ever was such a tradition of releasing prisoners. Scholar Jennifer McLean argued in a paper in 2007 that Jesus' passion narrative should be seen as a parallel with the Leviticus 16 Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement rituals. These are quite complicated, but they include two goats. Well, they actually include more than two goats, but there are two in particular. One is called the immolated goat, and the other the scapegoat. Both goats must be unblemished, and which is to perform what role is decided by lot. The immolated goat is taken to the temple and sacrificed as an atonement for the sins of the people, and to purify the temple. The high priest places all of the sins of the people of Israel on the head of the scapegoat, and it is then driven out into the wilderness, carrying the people's sins with it. Yom Kippur was, and still is, an annual event. Christians see Jesus' death as being a one-time purchase that made this annual rental scheme redundant. Furthermore, in Hebrews 9 verses 11 to 14, Jesus plays the part of the high priest in a heavenly temple using his own blood rather than the blood of animals, specifically in the role of the immolated goat, suggesting that Barabbas in this scene is not a historical figure, but a literary invention to serve the role of scapegoat against Jesus' immolated goat. That may indeed have been Mark's intention. Both goats are supposed to be pure, but note that Mark does not tell us that Barabbas was a criminal. He tells us that he was imprisoned with rebels who had committed murder during an insurrection. And Matthew thought the same way, because he adapted Mark's story to make Jesus and Barabbas look more similar, to make Barabbas look less criminal, and make the allocation of roles of the two men more similar to that of the Yom Kippur allocation of roles of the two goats. Matthew even gives Barabbas the first name Jesus. Verse 16. So the soldiers led him into the palace, that is the governor's residence, and called together the whole court. They put a purple cloak on him, and after braiding a crown of thorns, they put it on him. They began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Then they knelt down and paid homage to him. When they had finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Notice that Jesus does not have a third trial in Mark. In other Gospels, he has this toing and froing between Pilate and Herod, but that's not in Mark. Verse 21. The soldiers forced a passer-by to carry his cross, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, throwing dice for them to decide what each would take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. 
the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews, and they crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by defamed him, shaking their heads and saying, Ah, you who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, even the chief priests, together with the experts in the law, were mocking him among themselves. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also spoke abusively to him. You'll see that the text jumps from verse 27 to verse 29. Verse 28 is a variant reading absent from the Vatican and Sinai codices, which we'll return to shortly. With verse 27 it reads, And they crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right side and one on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. There are a few odd details here. Simon of Cyrene is not mentioned anywhere else in the Gospel. And also, why does Mark include that he's the father of Alexander and Rufus, neither of whom are mentioned anywhere else in the Gospel, and that he was coming in from the country. These details don't seem to be required by the narrative, suggesting that they may have a historical origin. Also, notice that the cosy conversation between Jesus and one of the thieves crucified with him does not occur in Mark. Those crucified with him spoke abusively to him. Dividing his clothes and rolling dice for them is from Psalm 22 verse 18. We'll see more of that psalm shortly. Verse 33. Now when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Around three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran, filled a sponge with a sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Leave him alone, let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. But Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. And the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood in front of him saw how he died, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger and Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee they had followed him and given him support. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were there too. So we have three hours of darkness. Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, which comes from the same psalm we just saw, Psalm 22, in this case verse 1. We've got the temple curtain torn in two, and the Roman centurion who just crucified him really understands Jesus. None of the disciples are anywhere around, and none of them will be heard from again in this gospel. There is no breaking the legs of those crucified with him, nor a stab in Jesus' side, hence no blood and water. The temple curtain divided the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred area only entered once a year by the high priest on Yom Kippur. It was seen as the central location of the presence of God on earth. The temple curtain was a barrier between the population and God. Mark's idea is that this barrier was a spiritual barrier caused by sin. The death of Jesus then removed this barrier. In verse 40 there were also women watching from a distance and Mary the mother of James, Joseph and Salome. This is the first time in Mark's Gospel that any of these women are mentioned, but it won't be the last. Now when evening had already come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a highly regarded member of the council, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. He called the centurion and asked him if he had been dead for some time. When Pilate was informed by the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen cloth and took down the body. He wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone across the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was placed. So there's no involvement from any of the disciples. 
just the recently introduced women, and this new character Joseph of Arimathea. It sounds as though he at least is headed for heaven.